the intergenerational conversation. It is with proud pleasure and all her esteemed guests to welcome, of course, my dearest, Cora Masters Berry. Uh, for nothing new under the sun, there is conversation, there are circumstances that we all face we need to know that there is a conversation and a perspective that needs to be shared amongst generations and definitely interest. Welcome all of our guests and everybody get to introduce you, but hello again, Ms. Mastersberry, how are you? I'm fine and I'm really happy to be back. Uh, good seeing you, good seeing the, the uh, people who tune in to Rolling Out, nothing new under the sun. Uh, I'm back because, you know, information is powerful, but more importantly, here to talk about a topic that affects everybody on the planet Earth. And this was appropriate time to uh, introduce that topic and give some updates and even some hopefully suggestions and some ideas about how we uh, approach this topic. I have as my very special guest, um, a, a intergenerational, I'll start with the youngest on the show, which is Ms. Dion Bussey Reader. She is a community activist and a leader in the Washington, D.C. area. She is a powerhouse in terms of community organizing and community services. She, uh, she is in charge of an organ. She's, a, I'm sorry, executive director of the Far Southeast Strengthening Collaborative. And of course, their goal is to provide services and fight poverty. Uh, she's a leader among leaders. Uh, the next ma young man that I have on the show is a gentleman named uh, Dr. Reed Tuxen. Uh, we go back. Marin and I we used to visit with him in California. He was president of the, uh, I said the Charles Drew University in Los Angeles, and we came, spoke to his class, had a few bites to eat, and it was fun. And I hadn't seen him, I've heard of him, heard about him in a long time, but as with many things, COVID brought us back together again. So I welcome you to the show and thank you for taking time out of your schedule to join us. And last but not least, I will introduce this young woman as somebody, um, my pastor used to say that God has things on this earth for men to do. God has things on this earth for women to do. And then God has some of his special angels on this earth. And uh, knowing what I know about this young woman, Dr. Gigi Albayumi, uh, she has been an angel on this earth beyond what we're going to discuss today. Her and her organization, the Rodham Institute that she founded, uh, has been in our community providing services, going deep in places and, and areas that I promise you, I'm not even trying to be funny. I wouldn't go. I, I, why is she over there? I'm saying that she just has a heart for the people and she founded that institute almost 10 years ago to do just that, provide an, uh, the equity that we needed in our community in terms of medicine. She is also a professor and a, a doctor at the university, I'm sorry, George Washington University. Um, so with that getting said, I want us to jump right into it. Um, there's an organization, I think, what did you just call it? Uh, Black Doctors Against COVID or Black Doctors Coalition, Dr. Tuxon? You're on yeah. mute. You're on mute, Dr. Tuxon. The Black Coalition Against COVID, uh, Cora. And I want you to tell us a little bit about why you needed to form that. What is the state of COVID for Black people in, in the United States of America? Well, we formed the Black Coalition Against COVID uh, because of my experience when I worked for uh, Marion, uh, Mayor Barry. Uh, when I was lucky enough to be the Commissioner of Public Health during the height of the AIDS epidemic, I learned an indelible lesson, and that is that if you're going to fight a health crisis of this magnitude, it requires a robust community-based grassroots mobilization. Government cannot do this by itself. It, it's top down, but you also have to have bottom up. I was very lucky that, uh, that there were so many people still in positions of influence across our community, whether it's in the labor movement with people like Josh Williams, uh, whether it is uh, people in the faith community, Reverend Tucker, Reverend Curry, uh, Reverend Bago, so many others, uh, whether it is people who are working with returning incarcerated citizens, like my good friend Roach Brown. Uh, they were just, I can go all the way across, oh, the musicians, the poets, the, the visual artists, all of these people who determine the culture of a community uh, are all part of uh, the Black Coalition. So we brought them together 
to try to mount this campaign, to be able to not only have the best science information, but to translate that into the culture of real life in the community. So we reached out and got people like uh, Gigi El Bayumi um, and so many others, uh, uh, people like Ambrose Lane, I can just go on and on. And of course, a huge partnership with Howard University and all of the robust assets within Howard. They, do, they gave us everything we could have wanted to launch us off. Lastly, uh, uh, Cora, I will say that the other part of the Black Coalition Against COVID, when we saw the challenges for um, vaccine clinical trials to make sure that Black folk were being in the clinical trials so that the vaccines could be, we could say with assuredness, with, with, with certainty that these vaccines work in people of color. So we knew we were gonna have a challenge. So we brought together the four Black medical schools, Howard, Meharry, Morehouse, Charles Drew in LA, plus the National Medical Association, the National Black Nurses Association. And then we reached out and got the National Urban League and blackdoctor.org. And all of that we pulled into one coalition to be able to provide trustworthy information from Black health professionals. Black health professionals, Corey, Corey as you know, have always been there when nobody else was for the Black community. We have a history of trust and trustworthiness and so we brought those assets to bear as well. So that's what the Black Coalition Against COVID is. Well, I am so glad that God has you here for us because we have a job to do with our people and you are the people we look to for just those reasons. And I'm kind of smiling and I'm not going to embarrass her, but one of my assistants, young young girl, about 23 years old, uh, comes in and out of my house. I asked her, was she going to get her COVID shot today? I mean, after the day. And of course she gave me the wrong answer. So, you know, that went on for a minute. So uh, I have her standing right here listening to all this good black stuff. So, you know, so she can go in and live her free life without running about what's the next uh, next journey. Uh, so I appreciate those. Um, uh, I appreciate the work that you do. And I know Dr. Albayumi, you are a part of that organization, but you also have another organization called the Rodham Institute that pretty much does what Dr. Tuck Tuckton said, you go to the underserved communities. Can you talk a little bit about what inspired the beginning of that organization? Yes, I will, because it was you. So Ms. Barry is my patient. And one time uh, she was running a little bit late for her appointment. And she said, I was making a run at Costco because the kids at the Southeast Tennyson Learning Center not are, are not only taking food for themselves, but they're taking it home for their siblings. And I'm like, wow, you know, I've always felt the hypocrisy of sort of the American government always kind of shaking their finger at especially Africa, saying, you know, oh, you know, it's, it's so corrupt, it's so this or so that. And I'm like, wow, the richest country in the world, in the capital, and you got kids that don't have enough to eat. So I did a fundraiser for you at the Egyptian embassy. So you actually set foot in Egypt and that was over 10 years ago now. And um, basically I found myself in a unique position. You know, I take care of homeless people. I take care of people from all over the city, Medicaid, Medicare, but I also take care of political celebrities. So the Clintons, the Rumsfelds, the Cheneys, a lot of people. And it just struck me that I was in this kind of space where I could leverage some of these relationships. That was number one. The second thing is, is that, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a doctor. I also was program director of our 108 residents for 15 years. And I noticed that medical students go into medicine for all the right reasons, but guess what? When they are done with their training, they sometimes objectify the very people on whose backs they train. And I thought about that, why is that? It's because the system of medicine actually teaches racism and classism. And I'm gonna give you an example. If you have two women both coming in with pneumonia, one is a uh, professor and another one is a homeless woman. She's got HIV, she's schizophrenic in the middle of a psychotic break, who is easier to take care of? Of course, the college professor. You tell her to take her medicines with food, she'll do that because she'll have food. You tell her to the refrigerate the medicine, she can do that. You tell her to call you if there's a problem, she can do that too. She knows how to navigate the system. But with that other woman, she is in a psychotic flare. 
She is, you know, she needs more assistance and hospital systems don't necessarily have that assistance for her. The people in administration are like, you got to get this lady out, get her out, get her out. But all you have is one shelter in all of DC for people who have medical problems. So what happens? These young learners see a black woman who's got all these issues because it's usually African-American versus white. And that becomes the surrogate of and begins to actually teach racism. So that was another impetus. But I just was shocked that one time, one of the um, staff at GW, Ms. Jackson, her goddaughter had just graduated from Temple University with honors and was killed in a drive-by, wrong place, wrong time. And so I had to take my niece someplace. My sister and her husband had five kids. So I had to take my niece someplace and then, um, but I wanted to go by the vigil to pay my respects. And this was before GPS and I got lost. And my niece is like, auntie, you're gonna make me late. And then we crossed over. And remember where they had the mural of all the people that had died, all those young people. My niece stopped, she was 12 years old at the time. And she said, auntie, this is worse than Egypt. The poverty, and that was out of the mouths of babes. And I'm like, you know what? I, I am a Washingtonian born again. I've been here 35 years. And I just felt like I had to do something. This is ridiculous. You know, you, this is ridiculous. We've got a 27 year span across the city between the richest and the poorest. That is inexcusable. So you did what? I established the Rodham Institute and uh, it is dedicated to improving health equity. Our three focus areas are workforce development, community collaborations with such wonderful people as Ms. Dion, yourself and Dr. Tuxen. And then educating people who work in the workforce, the healthcare community, about structural and social determinants of health. So I agree with you, Munson. I, each one of them is a show unto themselves, but we're here today, so we got to make the best of it because I could hear, I could hear uh, Dr. Tuxen and Dr. Albayumi talk for the next 45 minutes. And the and, uh, star of our show, the young lady, Dion, I love you. I know who you are. <laughs> Tell the world who you are. <laughs> I, listen, I'm like you, Mrs. Barry. I can sit back and listen to these two experts talk a lot longer than myself. Um, so thank you so very much for allowing me to be here with such great people. Honestly, I'm humbled by this. Um, I'm a Washingtonian, born and raised here. And um, similar to Dr. El Bayumi, actually, I just lived in a part of the city that was different than Ward 8. And I had the wonderful experience to get an opportunity to work in Ward 8. And my sister always joked with me about it until today. And she said, you're not from Southeast because I fell in love with Southeast. Not because of the things that I think now are so great, which are the beautiful landscapes, the fact that you can see any part of this city from some of the peaks in Southeast. And honestly, when I lived in Southeast, my neighbors took care of me so well, but I fell in love with Southeast because what bothered me the most is that the way I lived and grew up was much different than 15 minutes from where I drove every day to come to work. Um, it bothered me. It, it actually pained my spirit to see that I would go inside of a rec center and here in Ward 8 and children will be playing, I'll use an example, checkers. And they'll have to color some of the red checkers so they can even out and have some black checkers. Or they'll be playing pool and they wouldn't have a, a white ball. Um, those kind of things bothered me because in my community, that didn't occur. And I lived in D.C., didn't grow up in a family that was rich. I just grew up with two working parents. So it bothered me that we cared differently about people who look just like I look. And we didn't put the investment here. And um, your great husband actually did this wonderful, wonderful video, Ward 8 Past, Present and a Future. And he talked about how for 50 years, we intentionally put poor people in one community and then we expected a different outcome. So my whole life work, honestly, has been improving the outcomes, improving the economic standards for people who live in Ward 8. And that's what I do every day for a living. And I'm, I'm blessed to be able to do what I've been called to do. Similar to um, some of the other people that's on this call, I know this is a part of my calling. I've also gone to um, 
Howard School of Divinity to practice um, what I thought I was called to preach, but this is my ministry, um, trying to encourage people to live out their greatest potential, given the opportunities to do so. So that's the work that we do here in Ward 8. Um, I'm so blessed to be a part of an organization. We have five locations in Ward 8 specifically we're centered around the entire war, trying to be in pockets of the community that honestly actually need you to reach them so that they can understand how they have to reach out. So being a part of this group, um, I like the young lady that's sitting in front of you. I wasn't going to get the vaccination. I was a part of that whole group that thought it was a conspiracy and I was going to get some stuff put inside of me and I was going to live underground forever and not come out. <laughs> and I was going to escape this thing because I'm pumping myself with all of the right vitamins each and every day. And you very plainly said to me in one of our wonderful moments that you spent a lot of time with me and I appreciated tutoring me and giving me some good mentorship. And you said, Dion, you're a leader. And you can't profess to be a leader if you don't lead the people the right way. Mm -hmm. And that in and of itself changed the dynamics of how I felt about the vaccination. And I did my own research. From there, I joined a call with Dr. El Bayumi. I listened to Dr. Reed Tuxin, and he's been on many calls that I've listened to him, but I didn't pay attention, Dr. Tuxin. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to lie to you. It wasn't until someone who was close to me actually did exactly what I'm asking my staff to do, encourage people to do the right thing. Because quite frankly, I, like many others, have a pre-existing condition. And if I don't get vaccinated, I may not be here in another couple of months if I am, if I do contract the illness. So with that level of information, I realize like any everything else I'm doing here to encourage people to do the right thing and to propel themselves for their next situation and for their destiny, getting the vaccination, doing the right thing in this era in my life it's more important for the 75,000 residents that we represent in Ward 8. Well, so we got a great video. Why don't we take a moment to just check that out? I think it'd be great for us to breathe and relax and see the special PSA that's just traveling around the area. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to a friend and she said, I'm not getting the vaccination. And she said, I don't, I don't get vaccinations. I said, yes, you do. Stop that. And she says... No, I don't. I said, how'd you get through school? Well, yeah, other than that, I said, no, 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 I'm not finished. I said, you travel all over the world. Can I, I said, how many vaccinations do you have to get to go certain parts? You got to get vaccination for malaria, for tetanus, for yellow fever. I went down the list. I said, you mean all that time you're getting on them planes with your passport? You, well, yeah. I said, this is no different. And I said to all of the people who say they don't get vaccinated, yes, you do. You've been getting it all your life. And not all of a sudden, you don't get vaccinated. And this is the one that's going to save your life. So I'll, I say to all of them, if you think there's a conspiracy going on, explain to me. If I go and look at the crowd, most of the people that I see or a lot of the people that I see standing in line don't look like me and don't look like me. So do you think people are coming from across the city to get a vaccination to die? They're getting the vaccination to live and they're taking your shot. You stand around the corner talking about, I'm not gonna get it. They're coming and taking your shot and they're gonna live. Know this, if you're walking around and you're going anywhere outside your house, eventually it's gonna be a requirement. Get it now or get it later. And they, and they have a vaccination passport now. If you've traveled internationally, you know you get your shots and you have yep, a little yellow yep. thing and they, and they list them. And then when you get to customs, they open it up and they see that you got your yellow fever shot. That's no longer, you'll have your little, if you're from America, you'll have your little blue passport and you will have your orange vaccination passport. And if COVID is not stamped on that passport, you ain't getting out of the country. We're talking about, get your butts over here and get vaccinated. I mean, people say, oh, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna kill us. I say, well, they must be killing themselves because none of us is getting the vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> so okay that being said we are all on one page and, and, I, and I listened to the thread you know which goes through all of the people on this call including you King Munson and that is caring for our people and knowing how to care for our people and so uh, just very quickly uh, listening to these people on the call and watching television and reading for myself I became very aware of what was going on in this country. And so I woke up one morning early 
turned on the television and right in front of me were statistics. I always say it was a divine revelation from God. And on that, on that um, television, it showed 40% or more of people are getting the, are getting the, the, the virus and dying from it or people that look like me. And at that time, only 3% of us had been vaccinated. And so I was like, what? And then I just thought I have this big $50 million building sitting out in the heart of our community and it's doing nothing because we've been on quarantine. We can use it for the, for the, uh, for the community. We'll vaccinate all our people. We just go get them because I know why they're not doing it. So I had this vision. I called Mr. Tuckson, called Dr. Albayumi. I said, I want to, I want to vaccinate just families, all whole families. I want to vaccinate only the people with these two zip codes. And I want to vaccinate Johnson and Johnson because getting them back is not going to be easy. Get them one and done. And I, and, and I want to be exclusive about it. And then everybody said, that's a great idea. And then I will not even discuss the journey I went on after that. <laughs> but, but where we are today, uh, we have an amazing approach to this that I, I, I'm never been one of these people who yell at the television, but I yell at the television now when they put up their the things that say, oh, there's uh, uh, vaccination resistance in our community. Oh, we have 20 sites of, of uh, vaccinating, uh, vaccination sites in, in these communities. And I'm like, that is not how you reach our people. That is not access. Those are deterrents, you know. Oh, so make a long story short, Dr. Albayumi, Dr. Tuxon, Dr. Frederick at Howard University, uh, Georgetown University, all these different organizations came together and said, let's do this. Let's get a thousand vaccinations, thanks to the city and my mayor made available to us, Mayor Merrill Bowser, and let's see if we can vaccinate a thousand people that live exclusively. Now, when I say that, to this day, I'm not aware of any vaccination event that restricted the vaccinations to one zip code. Even if they had mass vaccinations in our community like they did a couple of weeks ago, it was for four different parts of the city. So you're not excavating our people. So we got with the community-based organizations uh, um, led by uh, Ms. Bussy Reader and we said that we're going to vaccinate our people from the ground up. We're going to have our community organizations reach out and vaccinate. We're not going to ask them to go to no portal. We're not going to ask them to get online. We're not going to, all we want to do, you want to do it, we'll we, we, we will register you. So that's just sort of the shell of it. But as we dig down into it, I'd like Dr. Albayumi and, and uh, Mr. Tuxen and uh, uh, Dion to talk about what we've done so far and why that's important for people to know about it. And also to uh, look at and, 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 and discuss as uh, Mr. Munson did before we got on the show, I want him to talk a little bit about this whole myth of, of, of uh, vaccination resistance. I hate that too, because I'm telling you, everyone that I have talked to that, that did not want to do the vaccination after a five minute talk, just educating them, just dispelling things, everybody's like, I'm ready. So it's not resistance, it's access and education that we're, that we're having a problem with. So anybody wanna jump in on that? Yeah, I'll start. Um, I think, you know, first of all, the medical community is, there is a medical apartheid system. And so it benefits the people that are of a particular race and class. And the, the, the real model that we need that is going to be equitable is one where the, individual, the family and the community are in the middle and the rest of us are spokes on a wheel. And so when you, you know, sort of invited us to be involved in putting this together, one of the things that I was very, very worried about was food, the food insecurity, which is actually one of the most important social determinants of mental health, as well as uh, mental health and also people not being in care. You know, I lost one patient from this pandemic and it was a gentleman that had diabetes that was poorly controlled and he died. Uh, and so during this time, there's been a 30% reduction of new cancer diagnosis. That's not good. We know who's gonna be impacted by that statistic. 
So we said, let's not only do the vaccines, but let's try to re-engage people. And look, let's bring all the systems together with the singular focus of serving the people of Ward A because- And I'm gonna interrupt you. For those who are watching this show from around the country, Ward 8 is your Compton or your Harlem or your Southside Chicago. It is a, 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 a community that has a large concentration of African-Americans with all of the problems of poverty. And so that's our Ward 8, so go. And so uh, before I turn it over to Ms. Dion, because she is a crucial member of this effort, you know, people, you know, where, where I live, where I live, which is not far from American University, I can trip over the number of grocery stores, pharmacies, clinics, the bus line is right outside of my place. So it makes sense that we bring these same resources to the community. So this is the beginning of the model. This is not just a one and done. This is how it should be moving forward because guess what? COVID is just the latest example of the disproportionate number of black and brown people dying. But Ms. Dion, I'm gonna pitch it to you because sure. you've been doing an incredible job. Sure, I appreciate it. I work with a great group of people and I will be remiss if I didn't mention one of my um, awesome young people who work with the Far Southeast Collaborative, Nikita Beans. She's our special project coordinator and she has done a yeoman's job in helping us to coordinate this effort. But we are actually excited because all of the community-based organizations that are, I would say, the largest organizations in the ward, we've come together. And I, I want to mention them, Martha's Table, Bread for the City, Community of Hope, S Smart from the Start. Wider Circle, 11th Street Bridge Project, um, the ARC itself, and definitely the Southeast Tennis Center. One of the things that we decided to do is we decided to, is like exactly what Mrs. Berry said, we're reaching out to the clients or the residents, or I like to call them the members, because they're members in our community, the members that we serve. And collectively, we are going guaranteeing Mrs. Berry that we're gonna have 1,000 Ward 8 residents confirmed and signed up. Now, how did that happen? It happened by the same way we started this conversation, relationships. We know our residents. We know how to meet them at their place of need. But we organized this effort because again, I have 70 employees in Far Southeast Collaborative. Half of my 70 was uncomfortable with the vaccination themselves. So we spent two weeks educating all of our organization staff, talking about those conspiracy theories talking about what happens with the differences of the three different shots. Why are we choosing Johnson & Johnson? Why aren't we getting Moderna? Why are we, get, we didn't get the Pfizer? Answering the questions that our residents will ask the staff. We wanted them to feel comfortable. Then we took an extra step and we said we didn't want any barriers. So we didn't want any barriers to transportation. So guess what else we did? We figured out how do we get people there? Dr. El Bayumi, because of the network with the actually Black Doctors Against COVID, we actually identified a new partner with Uber. Now we can give our residents rides to and from the vaccination site on April the 3rd. So now transportation isn't an issue. Then we came up with, well, what if I bring my child because I have no one else to watch your child? No problem. We have child care. We're working with the Learning Center, one of our native Ward 8, uh, she's a Ward 8 business, Ward 8 grown, graduate of Baloo, graduate of UDC, started a child care center right here in Ward 8. She's going to send over her staff. We're going to provide child care services. So people don't have to worry about what my child be cared for while I'm in line getting my vaccination. Then we said, well, what about making sure that we have crowd control? No problem. We got friendly security guards so you can direct people in the right direction. We are covering all bases for the residents of Ward 8 to feel comfortable in their community in a beautiful facility that's going to be not only socially distanced, we also will have food. We want to make sure that there are no barriers for our residents. And again, like Dr. El Bayumi said, it, this is just the first one. We're going to do this until we can vaccinate as many Ward 8 residents that need to get vaccinated. And the reason why is because we have the highest rates of all of the social determinants in this ward greater than any other place in this city. So why not start here? So together, all of us are meeting. And if you know Mrs. Berry, and if you're listening to this, you know Mrs. Berry, 
-hmm. She is truly the chief and she's the chief of this pro this operation. We're meeting every morning. And if she wants, she wants to count every night. So we're registering people every day and providing a count at the end of the day. And every morning we're meeting to debrief and plan how we want to execute this. And the reason why this is so important, and I'm going to close with this. We want to show our city officials that not only the Black Lives Matter, but Ward 8 matters. And we have to do something extra special for the residents who feel that they have been disenfranchised for so many years. So that's our effort. That's the work. And it's because of the partnerships that we've developed throughout this entire ward that's making this happen. So thank you. Well, thank you for that, Dion. And it more, when I listen to it, I really get excited. I was thinking about what you had said. Um, but Munson, how does that fit with your, uh, with your thoughts about this whole uh, vaccination resistance. Does it sound like that's what's going on here? <laughs> you know what, Mrs. Barry, before you answer, I left one of our strong partners out, Monica Ray. We have the, we have the Congress Heights Training Development Corporation and the Community College Preparatory Academy. They're also strong partners and bringing in hundreds of people to get registered. I want to leave them out at all. My apologies, sir. No, I, I think it's great. Um, I, I really think that there are a lot of myths as it relates to serving the black community, period, the poor, period, the children, period, women, period. Um, so I think those, those are my comments on that. Um, I'd love to hear from more of your guests um, because we have this wonderful coalition and we need to hear from uh, the good doctor. Well, what I was going to really ask him was, is it's what we're doing, is this the, the something that you think can and should be emulated? Because it really is a lot of work, but we take a lot of work. Do you know I equate this whole thing into getting out the boat? Is that granular? You know, do you have to really, in our community. So what do you think, Dr. Tuxon? Well, first of all, I'm thinking of uh, two people come to mind almost immediately as I was listening to Dion uh, uh, go through that. Number one is, uh, the person that taught me a great deal was a man named Calvin Rolock. And he said, no people but a people can save a people. And the second person I was thinking about was uh, our great teacher, Stokely Carmichael, who talked mm -hmm. about an undying love for Black people. Mm -hmm. And you have to be motivated with an undying love. And that will get you through all obstacles. And But what I think Calvin was saying, no people but a people can save a people, it's a call to arms, but what it also is is a call to competence. Let's remember that we may be people with problems, but we're not problem people. We're smart. We know how to work. We know we have the energy and we can be thoughtful. The model that's being produced here is one that I think will be a very great national model. And one of the great advantages of having the BCAC the Black Coalition Against COVID as a partner is we're going to document this. We're going to document it. We're going to write about it. We're going to share it. We are fortunate enough to be in touch with almost every major organization out there in the country and particularly with the Biden-Harris administration and the CDC. So we're being listened to carefully. We have a major community-based organization uh, town hall coming up. Uh, we're doing in partnership with the government and I'm pretty sure we're going to find a way uh, to bring this to bear. I also, uh, on our website, we're going to uh, feature this, the model. Once it's all laid out and the elements of it, uh, we're gonna feature this. And, and so my point being that we have to teach each other how to be competent. Uh, the last thing I would say is that it, when we get done COVID and there will be a time, now let's hope that everyone is listening to us tonight remembers this is a flat out full speed race to the finish line. I, I'm always laugh when I see the crazy football prima donna guy running down the field and starts to prance and dance around the five yard line and then drops the ball. The other team picks it up and runs it back the other way. I always laugh at those people, but I don't want to laugh at us <laughs> because you see, we're about to run down the field and then drop the ball on the five yard line. These variants are going to pick up the ball and run it back the other way for a touchdown. If you are one of those people that is, I'm tired of wearing my mask. I don't want to. So, hey, how does death sound to you? So let's make sure that we get people. You keep doing what you're doing and we race to the finish line. But when this is over, we're going to take up the sword against hypertension, diabetes, obesity, lung disease. You understand what I'm saying? 
And so this same model is going to work as we bring each other together creatively. And the last thing I'll say, and I think what Dion really kind of gets to that I really like, no more excuses. Well, I can't come because no child care. I can't come because I can't do this. It's always, I can't, I, no, no. What if we took away all the excuses? Now what you're going to do? You got to show them. So <laughs> well, I, we're going we're gonna to make the, the, the right thing to do the easy thing to do. And that's, that's what right. all this work is all about. That's well, let, but let me, also, I just want to add to that. Um, you're right, uh, Reed, and you're right, uh, um, Dion. This is just the beginning. I, I'm already... We're already talking with Howard University. Uh, they have a whole mobile unit thing. They want to bring out, bring the, the vaccination literally to the people's front door. So like a model of, we have a place in Southeast called the Wingate House. It's been around forever. I mean, it's history is about as colorful as that of the White House, maybe even more colorful. There's a whole lot of people up in there. And I don't expect to try to bring them out and bring them to the center. But my, uh, what I want to do is work with Howard they provide the, the, the services and the vaccination and we will continue our work with the community, educate, get to them two or three days, come on on Saturday, coming in with the vaccination. I'm gonna have a backyard band out there, but I'm pulling them out of that. I mean, this is what you have, this is, this is how you get the vote out. The way That's you right. get the vote out, the principal is the same thing. And so we're gonna do that. I, I wanna try to do, like Dion said, vaccinate as many people as we can in Ward 8. I mean, I want our numbers to go, I want our numbers to go formally down. And the only way to do that is just keep this out into the community and the way we're doing it, it opens up the door to continue that kind of granular uh, excavation, if you will, of our people so that we can bring them to a place where, you know, we can, we can help them save themselves, educate them. But I'm proud of my people too. They're not stupid people. They just, right. many times they've been uninformed and misled. That's but right. When you sit with them, like we have a system at the Southeast Tennessee Learning Center where they're calling to register them. And there's three categories. I'll do it. I've already done it. I ain't going to do it. And I say, send me all the ain't going to do it. And I take that list. And then I go down that list and that's my list every day, about five or six months. We have a really good conversation. They register and the rest is history. They just need people to take time with them. We're not expected to have the level of awareness because we've been so suppressed and repressed. So we have to do the extra mile. So on, when I watch television today, I don't know his name because that they all run together. They all run together. But I go back between CNN and whatever. But they were talking, of course, about the vaccination. And this guy, a very prominent guy in, in this topic, white guy said, and I quote, I'm not so concerned about categories as I am about access. Of course, I was yelling at the television. Yes, access, access. You know, making it. How are you going to have a, 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 a life-saving vaccination and tell people who have so many problems in their lives to sit on a phone for five hours hoping they can get a vaccination. How do you think that's gonna work for them? No. That's, that's a deterrent. Yeah. I mean, it's, yep. a, it's a deterrent for the best of us. Yeah. But you know, when you got Ma and them and you got June bug and you got lots of stuff, you don't have time for that. Mm -hmm. That's right. That doesn't that's fit into your lifestyle. Yep. Can I also add one more thing that I think is crucial uh, because this is something that certainly the Rodham Institute, but you know, your work, Ms. Barry, the Southeast Tennis and Learning Center, you're using, you're using tennis as a hook to get educated, but there has been study after study after study that shows when black physicians are, the numbers are increased and can take care of black people, guess what? Black people live longer. So one of the other wonderful opportunities of this event is that you're gonna have all the black doctors and nurses and pharmacists and so forth from Howard so that the little kids can say, oh my God, that's, that's a doctor. Wow, that's a nurse, that's a part. Because we have to in parallel at the same time that part of the education is also getting more people into the healthcare workforce because that makes a difference in terms of how long people live and getting educated. So 
I just think that this model is one that is so crucial and um, it is something that, as I say, is just the beginning. This is how it should always be. And, and Dr. Tuxen, I just want to let you know, at the education sessions that we've been doing, we've been showing the love letter yep. from the Black Coalition Against COVID. Sure can, 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 you, can you talk about that? Because I think it's so sure powerful. Have. It is. And, and, and it the is. Kamal Bell one. Yes, Kamal, we've been showing yep. the Kamal Bell. Both well, of yeah, thank you for that. And uh, the love letter is basically saying two important things to the community. It's a, it's a love letter from Black physicians to Black America. And the message is, number one, the first words, we love you. That the message that we are giving you comes from our heart, from the fact that we care about you. So whatever the conspiracy theories and all the other legitimate concerns that people have and questions that you have, you at least need to know that the people that are talking to you love you. And number two, we are saying, don't forget who we are. We have That's the right. same lived experience you did. We came out of the same place as you did. Absolutely. We, we, I done been beat up and beating the head and stopped yeah. by the police a gazillion times. <laughs> I've had the same talk with my grandkids that my that I had with my kids that my daddy had with me. We are the same lived experience. And so we're sort of saying, we're not just separate and apart. We are of you. And so thank you, uh, Gigi, for mentioning that. But at the end of the day, it is so important that we all understand that we have to love each other and care for each other, care about each other. And that means you have to care about our survival. So if you're gonna be right. spreading misinformation, if you're gonna be spreading rumors that have been planted often by white supremacists and Russian bots, if you're gonna be spreading information that come, and, and I tell you, you can tell, almost right off the bat where this information comes from when you start hearing right. some of these things. You, cause, cause I do like, I do three shows a day, town halls, national, and you can say, wait a minute, how can everybody be asking the same <laughs> right. crazy question? This right. comes from somebody who does not That's mean right. us well. So bottom That's line right. is if you care, then you have to care about our survival. And that's what this really is all about. You know what? You just gave me something. <laughs> The black folks talk about the, the vaccination is a conspiracy, and the conspiracy is for us not to take it. That's uh -oh. right. Hey, Cor, Cor, I got to interrupt you. The thing that kills me the most on <laughs> this true. thing is all these folks who, and, and, and I don't want to make light of it, the Tuskegee mm -hmm. syphilis study. And we are legitimately angry about that. Mm -hmm. You should be angry about mm -hmm. the Tuskegee. But what was the Tuskegee syphilis study all about? In large part, it was denying black men with a disease from getting access to the treatment that would save them. Now here we come Thank dying you. twice as often, hospitalized three times as often as the white man. And we're gonna deny ourselves the drug. But the, the Ku Klux Klan doesn't even have to lift a finger. That's the truth. <laughs> that's the truth. But that's the education of Dr. Tuxin. And it's because of the relationship. When people trust you, just like you said, I trust you guys. So I can say what you're saying to the population of people that you probably won't reach. And that's why it's so important. And I'm sorry, I just jumped in. We're having a conversation. I apologize. Yeah, sure, sure. But, but, but the thing is so important. That's why this, the way we're doing this, connecting to the community-based organizations, the way we're doing this is so profound because we're the ones that's on the ground each and every day, connecting to the people, talking to the people, hearing, hearing some of the doubt. But when we're able to say what you just said, and I can say to them, oh, I can get you a Dr. Tuxin, hear what he has to say. And when they hear that coming from you and you look like my father, you look like my, you look like my uncle, I can relate. It's a different situation. And that's why this, the way we're doing this for me, when Mrs. Barry shared this with me, I told her it can work. This can really work because we are relationship people. I trust you based on not just the color of your skin, but I trust you based on my relationship and you proven yourself to be right. So I just wanted history. to say that. That's and, it. And as Dr. Tuxer said, common history. Common That's history. Right. Well, right. today on one of the educational sessions, there's this uh, Muslim brother, I'm, I'm Muslim myself. And he talked about how at the beginning, he was like not going to get the vaccine right. for all the reasons. And then he, he took right. us through why his he process his mind. Right. So yeah. then I said, you know what? Let's get a video of him because that's mm -hmm. going to be much more powerful than me talking, right? That's right. Because it's important for people to see what 
changes their minds. So mm -hmm. I think. But I tell you, that's all good and well, but the most important thing that changes our people's mind a lot of times, if you can just get them to understand that you go, you, you, they hoodwinking you. Yes. You know, I, I said, I get back to the vote. Yep. I, when the brothers are telling me they're not going to vote, I, I said, just forget about who you're going to vote for. Let me just say one thing to you. As a political science professor and a historian, I can tell you, my specialty was the Constitution. Mm. This country has taken us from three fifths of a person to wherever, and they have made a lot of concessions that we beat it out of some of them. A lot of stuff they just said, okay. But the one thing, the one thing they will not concede to us is the vote. That's right. No, no matter what time, no matter what era you come up with, no matter what you do, they, well, I mean, come on now. I said, mm -hmm. has it ever occurred to you? that the reason they don't want you to vote, I said, you really are playing right into their hands. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Think mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. what I say with this fascination. Mm -hmm. You're playing into their hands. This mm -hmm. is a good way to get rid of a lot of us. Well, and and it's a hard. lot of us dying and a lot of the people out there, the brown people, and they can reduce the population because the whole thing is about population control and who's going to be in charge. That is why they're on this whole thing about abortion. I can go down the list, but the greatest threat to them is the vote. And the greatest thing they can get is COVID to help wipe us out and help reduce all them babies we done had and get some of our population going. I'm serious. Now, when I looked in the giant line and I saw the line wrapped around the corner. Giant and, and, and so and, deep. In Southeast. Now, no one would come over here to go grocery shopping like the rest of us do. But to see the line of people that none of those individuals look like the people that lived in this community, I said right then and there, oh, well, we got something else going on here. Because if they're going to get the vaccination, it's the same vaccination I'm going to get, then I need to get in that line. And that's the story we have to tell. We have to get in the line. Don't let somebody else take your shot. And Don't that's what we your shot. Push. Don't miss but your shot. I think the other thing that, that is even more pointed is we ended up at the back of the line when it came to getting the vaccine out. The other thing is for all the data, the data point in Chicago pointed to the fact that the worst, highest impacted COVID community in zip code didn't have the vaccine. So those are facts. Right. And so then you have intelligent black people telling themselves that they should be at the back of the line. So we've seen this, be at the back of the bus. Why would you want to be at the back of the bus? Why do you want to be last? But the data points to the fact that at the end of the day, the vaccine was not in the places that were impacted the most. That's true. Can I just can I just brag? Can I just brag on Dr. Reed Tuxen because he's been working so closely with the White House COVID Task Force, and he actually um, he he's modest, uh, but I'm going to say this: he is single-handedly change the discussion to make sure that the vaccines and the funding is going where it should be. Community-based organizations such as Ms. Dion's and others, but he's been doing a lot of the behind the scenes work and he probably will never be uh, viewed as such as impacting millions of people's uh, lives, but he has actually been very hard at work to address exactly that point of the misallocation uh, of of resources, so that's so, that's so nice of you. I, I but really it's true all the time. But let me tell you, I, I think we even let me, let me tie it back. There were a couple of issues in black media where they were talking about how white PR firms and white marketing firms are finding black subcontractors to get out the virus information, or black focused media, targeted media that does not have the same connections as black owned media. So mm -hmm. I think many times when we talk about this, the discussion recently is all these black subcontractors in the communications, you're talking about mm -hmm. $1.5 billion. Mm -hmm. And the rumor says, well, why does it have to go to a white person first? At the end of the day, I just wanna go to the tennis center and get a shot. I don't wanna leave my community. I want somebody I trust there. And I think with the dollars that you're talking about, why would white PR firms be driving it? Why exactly. would we be getting subcontractors and people calling us to be subcontractors 
for COVID information dissemination. So I think that these are the things that we need to be concerned about at the end because Cora Mastersberry doesn't care how much money at the end of the day Miss Reader makes. She wants her to be funded. At the end of the day, how we touch the money is gonna be a concern for our healthcare. And I think that's the issue that we're really facing because you'll have a diminished return. Everybody don't wanna feed the kids. Mm -hmm. There are people that are gonna be in Alabama and people are gonna be mad that you're feeding children or having healthcare. And I think mm -hmm. these are the places where we really have to watch the most. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. Let me just also, uh, in addition to that, uh, Brother Munson, let me uh, segue off of the generous comments by Gigi. I'll tell you what, what, what you learn by watching what's happening inside the White House. And what you're learning, and, and, and Cora talked about saying that it's like getting out the vote. Why is it important to vote? It's important to vote so that you have Kamala Harris in the vice president's office so that when the bureaucracy in government is slow or is not moving like it ought to move, just dangling Kamala, whose head is in the game, by the way, Kamala's head is in the game. No, she's woke. She's, she's paying woke. attention to the details. So when you basically know that you got the vice president watching, all of a sudden, little insignificant people like me, you begin to have a little more juice because there's somebody up, somebody with some real juice who's there. So my point is, is uh, 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 that everyone should learn the lesson that Cora is trying to teach, that the, that the vote, get out the vote and get out the vaccine are connected. It's the same stuff, the same work, they're intimately connected. And we got to remember that, that mm -hmm. you can't, this stuff doesn't happen in silos. It's just this, no, it all blends it's together. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm, so wait a second, Ms. Barry, can you, um, <laughs> cause I, did you notice how Dr. Tuxon just kind of went over that compliment? Just, so can you please tell us, no, though seriously, all seriousness, what have you been talking with the White House COVID task force about uh, in terms of this uh, money appropriations? Because I think that that's so important. One of the challenges that, that we have, and it comes back to, again, why I'm so excited by the work that Cora and Dion and you are doing, is it comes back to competence. The, the ability to take an idea and implement it in real life. What's challenging for the government is you've got the federal apparatus who has ideas about what they want to do. You've got the, the White House effort, you got FEMA, and then you've got the CDC. All of that are different lines. They have to be organized and coordinated. But then what happens when the goes to the state? The state can do whatever it wants to do. And then the county can do what it wants to do. If you've seen one public health department, you've seen one public health department. They're all different around the country. How do you make that system work? And at the end of the day, how do you then say to a state like Mississippi, uh, Georgia, how do you say to them, when you get your dose, you need to make, you have to have, when you get your supply, you need to have pre-existing contracts or relationships with organizations mm -hmm. like Dion's so that there is a connection. And by the way, how do we track to see who got how much and got what? So what That's we're doing right. with the White House, and, and there are two, <laughs> there's some two really bad folk I mean, we got a brother and a sister in top jobs, Dr. Marcella Nunez Smith, mm -hmm. who's in charge of health equity, and brother Dr. Cameron Webb. Both of these are outstanding. And they're young and they and they're smart. They're so smart they kill me. And so they're working. <laughs> so they're now the ones that we're talking to. And what we're basically trying to do, uh, Gigi, is to be able to say, here is a blueprint from those of us who have been here before. We've seen this game. Uh, 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 Deborah Frazier Howes, the great black woman who was so pivotal at getting money for AIDS out of the out of the government back in the AIDS fight. Here mm -hmm. is how you make you go from an idea to money flowing, contracts written, and guarantee that it gets where it's supposed to go. And so those are the things that we are sharing. But I'll tell you what, it's a whole lot easier when you got a Marcella Nunez Smith and a Cam Webb in the top jobs. Ooh, it's yep. like in the room where it happens. You got to have mm -hmm. people in the room. So what we would like to do uh, is, as you said, uh, Dr. Tuxin, is pull this model, of which we've done many, many versions of it, but put it in a, a way in which we can utilize it for other people and that you can help us get attention to it so that we can keep perpetuating it. And you're right. 
of course, that's one of my downfalls. I'm just not an, um, I'm not an entrepreneurial person. I think with my heart, I don't think about money until I look up and say, I came up with an idea that I don't have no money for, or it didn't even cross my mind. That's everything I've ever done started with me not having a penny, including building that building. So when I got to start getting into this, stuff started costing money. And I said, I didn't even look for getting funding for this, you know, with security and, 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 and what we have to do to get the place ready and getting people out there on the street. I mean, we just taking it out of our budgets and out of our pockets because I didn't think in advance. And there's a hundred zillion trillion gazillion, as my granddaughter said, dollars coming down. I'm hearing about it on television for COVID, uh, for vaccination and all of that, all to community-based organizations. And I'm like, we, we need a couple of dollars to finish this, this project up, but we never think about that. And so when we have somebody like you, you can help, you know, us know how to do that so we can continue this because we don't want to stop right now. We want to continue to do what we do. If we're going to continue to work with Howard, we have to have resources. And I don't think any of us ever thought about it because every day we, we come up with something and we just do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Four minutes. <laughs> Wow, there's so much to say, um, but I, I will say this. It is time to dismantle the apartheid system here in the United States. It is long overdue and uh, the roots are very deep and people have been paying for their lives the minute that this country was established and that the way that we do it is through economic development Yes. It's institutionalizing change, you know, all of these elements that have really been touched upon. But if I were to choose one thing, it would be education. Education. Um, and, and, and look, I mean, let's be real. There has been a, there has been a dis deliberate dismantling of communities of color, specifically African-American communities. So leaders need to come together. We need to work together to keep this going because it's a long road. It's like a marathon. And I think we're learning a lot from this pandemic, but we got to keep it going. Yeah, I think it's been a silver lining in a lot of different ways. Uh, not just, uh, well, everything. I mean, there's a lot of good, I mean, a lot of bad things that happen, but that's what happens with change and God is stirring things up, getting it to where it needs to be. Sometimes, you know, they're, they're the consequences that go with that. But I've learned a lot. I've grown a lot. And I've done things in this pandemic that I wouldn't have thought about doing. I, how did I get in the vaccination business? That's not my thing. If there wasn't, <laughs> if there wasn't a pandemic, I'd just be doing what I do, you know. Yeah. You You're know? in a people you know, business. You're just in a people know, course, business. No, go ahead, Neon. I want to hear what you got. No, I was just saying she's in a people business. That's what we do. But, we, but there's something else. We that, fill in. There's something else that we need to all learn from, and that is the word innovation. We have to learn to learn. We have to evolve. Instead of our looking at the challenge we have and going, oh, my God, we're victims. They're trying to do me in. Oh, my God, we are at the mercy of the, of the whole world. We have no control. No, we take control of our lives. We deal what we got to do. We learn what we got to learn. You know, the, the, how did they develop this vaccine so quick? It's terrible. How did they do that? Or, my God, human beings are geniuses. I mean, can you imagine the progress of science? I'm so excited. No, it's, I think there's something wrong and I'm mad. I mean, there's different ways. How do we learn to innovate and be excited about ideas? That's the thing. And what Cora is teaching is you learn new skills because you got to keep moving. And if, I, if I can just add this last piece, through this pandemic, we've learned, we've learned to appreciate opportunities. This connection that we're making, I look at all the programs and the partnerships. We have a Thrive program that we've actually, in this last year, 400 families through another partnership was able to get $5,500. Many of these people were out of work. They paid their rent. They paid, and people got cars so they can get to jobs. I mean, this pandemic brought us together. It was an opportunity for us to do more work, better work, more innovative work, like Dr. Tuxon said, to serve more people. So for me, I have to look at the silver lining. I have to look at what's better. I got to look at the glass half full so I can stay in it and be as innovative as I can be to help more people. So, Ms. Berry, my head off, is to, it, off to you. Thank you. Thank I you. I want to thank all of you. Uh, Mr. Munson, you want to take us out? Yeah, I, I Dr. Uh, Tuxon, I, I just want to say you had that phenomenal Stokely uh, quote. 
uh, an undying love for black people. Um, I think that uh, when we think of Cora Berry, not only is she an innovator, but anybody that stays in the hustle and stays in the street, know that you got to keep hustling and you got to innovate because the game changes each and every day, particularly for people of black color and any other color around the world. Um, I think the, the fact that she is there and she has an undying love for every generation and wants to touch future generations by being an example of what service and undying love for black people is, black people. I think that's the thing about Cora Masters Berry. When we're all here, it is about her illustration of what it is to provide service and love undyingly like Stokely and say their name. So you'll not be forgotten, Dr. Tuxton and Dr. L by you may, uh, you will not be forgotten <laughs> at all. Um, so that's not going to happen. And Dr. Tuxton, clearly history will showcase that his service to the community beyond Charles Drew and every other place that he has yes. actually talked so that people will say his name. Um, you do not have to be in the streets, everybody, but you do have to be in the struggle. I'm Munson Steed. This is mm -hmm. nothing new under the sun. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>